imagine Sean Dyke taking his Burnley lads on a duck shooting trip to, you know, <laughs> team bonding. I can't really... Oh, he'd and be it... more paintballing, I think, Sean Dyke. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, or, or proper SAS stuff, you know. <laughs> yes, you know, that's it. Right, let's let's smear our faces in mud and crawl to France or whatever. <laughs> Welcome to the latest episode of Season 2 of Football and Covered. In Season 1, we took you inside Blackburn and Leeds, Portsmouth and Liverpool, FIFA and a lot more. Heard about extraordinary stories of football chaos, cock-ups and outright corruption. This season, we're going inside eight more Premier League clubs as well as having two special episodes, one about after the Premier League and one about the very future of club football at the highest level. I'm your host, Will Brazier, and every episode, I'll be joined by Nick Harris from Sporting Intel. Nick, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Raring to go on this one. Um, We've had some shocking statements over the first series and, of course, the second series, but there's one we're going to get to very shortly, um, that you're actually a Saints fan, aren't you? I am. I, I confess at this point, I think I might have mentioned it before, but I am actually a Saints fan. And so this episode for me, where we're looking at some of the strange and funny and uh, depressing and exciting times at Southampton in the last couple of decades it is particularly special to me. Well, so it's not just me and Nick. Each episode will be joined by a special guest, usually a fan of the club we're talking about or someone who has followed them very closely, as well as sharing all the usual inside stories from each club. We'll be looking, of course, at the owners of the club, how the current owners came to be there and where they've taken the club so far. And also what's next? It's been a topsy-turvy season for most football clubs for 2020 and 2021. And in the Premier League, this hasn't been more true than at Southampton who were top in November, albeit briefly, had another 9-0 defeat and endured a nine-game run of not winning a match recently. And that is against the backdrop of being as low as League One a decade ago before climbing back into the Championship for 2011-12 season and then getting back to the Premier League in the summer of 2012. Nick is a Saints fan as well as a reporter who has covered the club on and off the field over different points over the last 25 years. But we're delighted to have another Saints supporter on as our special guest today. That's Ben Stanfield, who was on Twitter at Ben Stanners and also hosts a brilliant Total Saints podcast. Ben, how are you? Not too bad, Will. Yeah, apart from that sort of uh, run-in you gave about Saints and how emotional it is at the moment, to be honest. But yeah, nice to be with you. Thanks for inviting me on. I was going to say, even I was getting a bit depressed going through it all. Um First of all, we'll talk a bit about the podcast. You've had some amazing guests on there. And I mean, as a Saints fan, you just must love doing it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm Southampton lad, born and bred. Um, been following them 35 years or so. Um, a bit like Nick, I think, through the ups and downs. And lucky enough to watch them at the Dow and St Mary's and follow Matt Letizia's career right up to that last minute goal against Arsenal at the Dow. And there's been some incredible moments. And yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, I, I moved out of the area about 10 years ago and not too far away from Nick now, actually. And to keep myself involved uh, and uh, some of the relationships I had with the club um, started the podcast and uh, it's it's gone from sort of strength to strength. It's uh, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, as I'm sure you guys will know, putting something together like this. But yeah, I've been really lucky where we've had some fantastic ex-Saints on like Letizia, Franny Benali, James Beatty. I was lucky enough to speak to Ricky Lambert, Terry Payne, you know, legends of the club, to be honest. And then we just celebrated 150 episodes a couple of weeks back by speaking to Laurie McMenemy, who, of course, won the 1976 FA Cup with Saints, probably our most successful manager ever. And uh, halfway through as well, we did a, a tribute to Marcus Lieber, which was 10 years on from when he took over at Saints and uh, probably a nice segue into today. Should we get into the sort of Rupert Lowe era then? Because for me growing up, uh, I was born in 91. Uh, just don't want to, not throwing any shade there, Nick, so. Um <laughs> But Southampton, for me, were just the Premier League club for, for all the time growing up. And then obviously that moved to St Mary's and we've seen it with so many clubs where they move to a new stadium and it's supposed to be the sort of catalyst to go on to European football and, and success. But it didn't quite happen like that, did it, Ben? No, I think, um, as you say, it's uh, uh, when you look back at it now, and I think Nick shared some uh, data with us beforehand, you look at the, the amount of managers we had and uh, I think Rupert Lowe obviously came in and I don't think he's particularly well thought of now when you look back at his time with the club. Um, I, I think he's got a, a relationship with fans that didn't really work out. I think probably because they see him as the, the face of the individual that got us into administration in 2009. I mean, Rupert was famously a hockey playing, rugby loving <laughs> businessman. He His hobbies included duck shooting. Now, I mean, it's just not your football fan demographic to sort of talk about duck shooting. I think, Ben, you've got an anecdote about the <laughs> yeah, duck yeah. shooting, haven't you? 
he was obviously trying to build rapport, wasn't he, within the club and the squad? And I think, I think you know, as, as we know, chairmen never really get on particularly well with the manager and the and the first team squads these days. So they try to keep themselves separate, don't they? But uh, I think, yeah, Rupert Lowe tried to sort of build this connection by taking the first team out on a a bonding trip, as he called it. Um, and so I, th- I think they all sort of rocked up. He, he lived up Winchester way, I think, didn't he? Up that that neck yeah. of the woods. And um, yeah, mm. essentially, it turned out that they were t- he was taking them duck shooting, right? So the, all these <laughs> players turned up, and you know, they're just shooting defenceless ducks, which you know, again, is is. <laughs> just bizarre isn't it but i'm not sure it went down particularly certainly as rupert planned anyway nick no so there's so you know you've got i mean that's just crazy isn't it can you imagine i'm just trying to think <laughs> of a, a modern manager can you imagine sean dyke taking his burnley lads on a duck shooting trip to you know <laughs> team bonding i can't really oh, it'd Any... be more paintballing i think sean dyke <laughs> exactly yeah or, or proper sas stuff you know <laughs> yes you know, that's it Right, let's let's smear our faces in mud and crawl to France or whatever. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know the appointment of Harry Redknapp in oh, wow. uh, in December two thousand and four. Just uh, wherever Harry's been, his mantra has always been: "If we will be all right, if we can get a few bodies in." And it was very much right. He's going to get some bodies in, but the bodies, you know, and he did get some bodies in. And and then when it looks chaotically bad and relegation is imminent it's it's all about it goes from if we get a few bodies in we'll be fine to it was a hopeless situation when I arrived there was no (laughs) there was no realistic way I was going to turn it around and it was just like f off you know it's just like you know don't give me that you you know and I know all managers do that kind of thing yeah we've got a tough task on our hands but if we get a few bodies in we'll be fine and then you've got you know, we know what sort of character is. We know Harry is in terms of his background in football, his approach. He's very much a man manager. He's very much old school. And Rupert must have known this and, and presumably have trusted that, that this was going to work. So to then try and make a marriage, and, and this is like one of the most jaw-dropping press conferences, you know, in Southampton recent history, when Rupert introduces Sir Clive Woodward in the summer of, of 2005 and says he's going to make him technical director. I don't know if you remember this, Will, or you, Ben. The cringeworthiness of having Harry, Rupert, I think, was in the middle. And if I was Harry was on the left or right and, and Clive Woodward's on the other trying to make it was so uncomfortable yeah I don't, I don't remember the press conference so much but I do remember there was lots of jokes going around about oh, are they going to replace the goals at uh, Staplewood training ground with rugby post now and they're going to try and teach you know all those sort of things so there was a lot of sort of jest about it and yeah, you know, obviously it never worked out in the end did it no and, and and you know again it was one of those things Rupert was definitely he was into innovation he wanted to try different things he tried different things in terms of you know the youth setup and recruitment they were very innovative in some ways in the way that they were able to spread the net wider because they were um you know they got special permissions at different points to have to because you were a team um in a port town you don't you obviously you don't have your your 20 mile radius or your 50 mile radius or whatever it is has got the sea so they actually had dispensation to uh, recruit elsewhere in the country i think that's how they got bailed didn't they mm-hmm. because yeah, from outside it. the ground so so Lowe was doing doing different things that were innovative and who's to say that that maybe clive woodward as a uh, essentially a, pro- a brilliant project manager when the england rugby coach <laughs> team won won the world cup you know um couldn't have come into a different sport and put in place bits and pieces but it was never ever ever going to work him in tandem with Harry and so ultimately it was a bad idea so you get relegated you then get boardroom chaos with um oh what's Wilde's first name Michael Michael Wilde Wilde takes over in 2006-7 then uh, Rupert comes back and, and they're sort of in it together and then Rupert's back in 2009 and ultimately you know is there um as we go down again you know so uh, at the clubs getting towards the lowest ebb, League One, that was ultimately under under Rupert's watch. Yeah, and, and I think that's um, the thing, isn't it? It's, it's the fact that that's probably the last in memory is, you know, we when we did go into administration, we had, I think it was £27 million worth of debt. And most of that was owed to Barclays and Aviva because of the new stadium. You know, that's yeah. essentially which Rupert had driven. And I, I think, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, Will, Saints, you, you know, undoubtedly we had to move from the Dal if we wanted to progress as a club. There's, I don't think any fan would disagree with that. And I totally agree with what you said, Nick, in that 
I think it's unfair to criticise Rupert Lowe 100 percent because he doesn't deserve that. However, the memory is, yeah, you know, we went into administration with 27 million pounds worth of debt for a football stadium that he'd kind of made it his baby to basically build that. Every Saints fan is is in in immense, you know, lifelong gratitude to the Lieber family for saving the club. And like you said, it was 30 million pounds. It was like you said, he said it was a bargain. It, it, it needn't necessarily have been a bargain if we'd continued the fall and gone down to the fourth tier. But we didn't because of Cortese and um, and Marcus's money and a plan that worked. But before we get on to Cortese and, and how much he actually really drove it and was really the inspiration behind getting Lieber to do the deal in the first place. Ben, you tell me about 2010. Yeah, I, I think ultimately... You know, we started that season with the, the points deduction because, of course, we'd obviously um, come down with the, the administration over our heads. So I think um, quite quickly, um, Cortese came in and, uh, and you know, we made Alan Pardew the manager. So I think that was quite a good um, uh, appointment from the fact that he'd obviously had Premier League experience and uh, sold this five-year plan. And straight away, I mean, we spent a million pound, I think it was, Nick, on, on Ricky Lambert in that 2009 summer. I mean, again, you look back now, I mean, I think it was 115 goals in about 200 games. I, I don't think there'll ever be a million pound that's better spent in football, certainly in the, the future. <laughs> it was a, a tough time because, of course, he was trying to build a squad at the same time of the club trying to find its feet and try and work out what it was doing from a strategic point of view. Um, but, uh, you know, the pinnacle of that season was undoubtedly getting to the, the Johnson's Paint Trophy, winning at Wembley against Carlisle 4-1. And for me, you know, I'll always think back of that, that overriding memory that I have of Marcus, Nick, is when the players are up there and they're lifting the trophy, Marcus was known as this gentle giant, you know, massive guy, very, very quiet, very humble. And there's just a picture of, if, if anyone's not seen it, if you look at the the picture of when Dean Hammond's lifting the trophy you can see Marcus Lieber behind him and he's got the tiniest camera in the world and he's basically <laughs> taking a picture of the guys I mean it's ridiculous and uh, I think for me that'll always be the, the memory because he, he passed on a couple of months after that and to know that he'd passed away having seen the team that he'd um, sort of saved almost going to Wembley winning a trophy it felt like um, you know a really really magical moment and I think for me whilst that 2010 season was a tough one they didn't get promoted obviously and you know they did the following season but just you know almost being able to sort of look back and think that's it's kind of the start of a new chapter you know we could have gone out of business but here we are we're now taking our first steps forward and who knows what the future is going to bring I heard a remarkable thing uh, my understanding is when um, Lieber bought the club he kind of made an, an agreement with Cortese that you know I think that the, the club is worth 13 million pounds today that's what I've paid for it if at some point down the future we turn it into a successful Premier League football club and sell it for however much, 100 million, 200 million pounds. I think there was a gentleman's agreement, as I'm told, that Cortese would, having been the force that transformed the club, take a cut of the profit from the sale of the club. So when Katerina, as I understand it, decided sort of enough was enough in Nicola doing everything his own way, I think he was the one-man board at one point, literally the one-man board, so oversight and scrutiny of decisions and spending, it was Nicholas scrutinising himself, and I think Katarina wanted some independent directors and to have a bit more oversight to be able to say, well look, just checks and balances, and Cortese was adamant that he didn't need checks and balances, I've come this far, and I think they got into a, into a negotiation where they were like, well this is not going to work out, so um, you're going to, you know, if you're going to leave, um, we'd like to, and I think the offer was they offered him something like £20 million to sort of, as a severance deal, to, to acknowledge his role in how much he'd taken the club. And on a point of principle, he refused to have the money. So he did end up walking away, but on a point of principle, he, tur he, he, he turned down, as I heard it, £20 million which again wow. just shows you maybe he didn't need the money. I don't know how much you make as a banker, <laughs> but maybe maybe he didn't need the cash. But um, that was it, and so he was out. And at that point, Poch was the manager. The setup looked good to go. Systems were start being put in place for smooth transition. You know, the, this whole ethos of we can't change the club's policy every time we change a manager. We can't have different recruitment. You've got the famous black box recruitment tools you've got the analytics not quite marginal gains but um all that sort of you know more scientific and consistent approach and so it proved through the potch rain the replacement was cumin through the cumin rain you know it was all smooth and then we come to club puel 
you know, he didn't <laughs> he didn't work out, but the system seemed to be in place. And those that was those years, the Potch years and the Cumin years were were great, weren't they? Yeah, totally. I, I think that season with Cumin when we finished sixth was probably my most enjoyable as a Saints fan of the 35 years. I mean, you look at the, the team, the way they played. I mean, we had Virgil van Dijk, Sadio Mane, Dusan Tadic, Graziano Powell, one of probably the best looking footballer I think I've ever seen in my life up front. Um, <laughs> and, and you're right. I think it was just, uh, I think we all remember, don't we, that that first photo. I, I know it went, it, it went virtual on, uh, or Vara, sorry, on uh, social media of Kuman taking the picture out the training ground to say like first day at training, looking forward to it. And basically there was no players on the pitch because Les Reed had just sold them all, you know, and it was like, that was the joke, wasn't it? And uh, um, I, th I think, as you say, I mean, for, for me, you, you know, Claude Powell, I think got a bit of a hard time because as Leicester fans will know, if they're listening, the football was a bit dull and we didn't score many goals and trying to follow on from Cumin that had been so successful and so much flair almost, I think that was kind of chalk and cheese, wasn't it? But that, that yeah. whole period with Pochettino, I, th I think, yeah, what, what they both had, Pochettino and Cumin, was a nucleus of a really talented side. <laughs>